Nevada just dumped 100,000 desert tortoises into a landscape that looked like the surface of Mars. Charred earth, ash everywhere, and not a living plant in sight. The scientists said it was crazy. The environmentalists called it reckless. And honestly, they might have been onto something. But what happened next turned everything we thought we knew about desert recovery completely upside down. Keep watching, because this story gets wild. Picture this, and the Carpenter One fire has just finished throwing a temper tantrum across 300,000 acres of Nevada desert. That's roughly the size of Los Angeles. The entire landscape looks like someone took a flamethrower to it for three weeks straight, which, well, basically happened. Every piece of vegetation, gone. The soil, baked into a weird crusty layer that water just slides right off of. Even the rocks look sad. Now, desert tortoises are already having a rough time. These guys have been around for millions of years, surviving ice ages and continental shifts, but they can't seem to handle us. Their population dropped by 90% in just 40 years. 90%. That's not a decline. That's a nosedive off a cliff. Between off-road vehicles crushing their burrows, solar farms eating their habitat, and everyone's favorite invasive species, bringing diseases, these ancient reptiles were getting absolutely wrecked. But here's where it gets interesting. The Nevada Department of Wildlife had a warehouse full of tortoises. And when I say warehouse, I mean it. They'd been collecting tortoises from construction sites, rescuing them from highways, basically playing desert turtle uber for years. The problem, they had nowhere to put them back. Every good habitat was either full or on fire, sometimes both. Then someone looked at the carpenter one burn scar and had what can only be described as either a brilliant idea or a complete mental breakdown. Maybe both. They said, let's release them here into the burned desert. The one that looks like Mordor had a bad day. The scientific community lost its mind. And honestly, fair. You don't just dump 100,000 animals into a dead zone and hope for the best. That's not conservation. That's expensive littering with extra steps. Desert tortoises need food. They need shelter. They need burrows to hide from predators and temperature extremes. This burned landscape had none of that. It was a blank canvas. Except someone had also set the canvas on fire. But Nevada was desperate. They had tortoises stacked in climate-controlled facilities, like some kind of reptilian apartment complex. And it was costing taxpayers millions. The animals needed to go somewhere. So they did something that in hindsight was either genius or insane. They shipped them out in waves starting in late 2020, right after the monsoon season started. Matters a lot. The first few weeks were rough. Scientists tracking the tortoises with GPS tags watched them wander around like confused tourists in a foreign country, which technically they were. Some dug shallow burrows in the ash. Others just kind of sat there probably questioning their life choices. The mortality rate in month one was higher than anyone wanted to admit in public. But then something started happening that nobody predicted. The tortoises weren't just surviving. They were working. Desert tortoises are basically tiny bulldozers with shells. When they dig burrows, they're not just making homes for themselves. They're creating underground highways that other animals use. Insects, even small mammals, move into abandoned tortoise burrows like they're desert real estate. But more importantly, when tortoises dig, they mix soil layers. They bring up nutrients from deeper down. They create these little pockets where water can collect instead of running off. Within three months, something bizarre started showing up on satellite imagery. Green spots. Not everywhere, but clustered around areas where the tortoises had been most active. The researchers thought their equipment was broken at first. The fire had been too hot, too complete. They found something that made absolutely no sense at first glance. Plants were growing. But not just any plants. Native perennial grasses that hadn't been seen in that area for decades were popping up. Wildflowers that only grow in undisturbed desert soil were appearing. And here's the kicker. They were growing primarily around tortoise burrows and trails. The tortoises weren't just surviving in the burned landscape. They were somehow making it come back to life. So what was actually happening here? The science gets pretty wild. Desert tortoises are what ecologists call ecosystem engineers, which is a fancy way of saying they physically change their environment in ways that help other species. Think beavers building dams, but slower and with more shell. When a desert burns, especially a hot burn, 
like Carpenter One, it creates this layer of hydrophobic soil. The fire heats organic compounds that rise through the soil and then condense below the surface, creating this waxy barrier that repels water. Rain just runs right off instead of soaking in. Without water penetration, seeds can't germinate, even if they could. There's no nutrients in the top layer anymore. Everything's been vaporized. It's a desert, but now it's a dead desert. There's a difference. Enter the tortoises. Every time they dig, they're breaking through that hydrophobic layer. They're mixing the dead surface soil with the living soil underneath. Their burrows become collection points for seeds, organic matter, and most importantly, water. Rain that would normally just wash away gets funneled into these underground chambers where it can actually do something useful. But wait, there's more. And this is where it gets really cool. Tortoise poop. Yeah, we're talking about tortoise poop. Dessert tortoises are herbivores. They eat plants, digest them poorly, and then deposit partially digested plant material all over the place. In a normal desert, this is just part of the nutrient cycle. But in a burned desert with no plants, those tortoise droppings became seed bombs. The tortoises had been eating at the facility before release. Their digestive systems were full of seeds from native plants. When they pooped, they weren't just fertilizing the soil, they were planting a garden. Researchers analyzing the green patches found something astounding. The plant species coming back weren't random. They matched the diet of captive desert tortoises almost perfectly. These animals had literally carried an ecosystem in their guts and then deployed it across 300,000 acres. It's like they'd packed moving boxes for their new home. Except the boxes were internal and the furniture was alive. By year two, the results were impossible to ignore. Satellite data showed that areas with high tortoise density had 400% more plant cover than areas without tortoises. 400%. That's not a margin of error. That's a whole different ecosystem. The burn zones with tortoises were recovering faster than some areas that had burned 10 years earlier and never gotten any help. Other species started showing up. Lizards first then snakes hunting the lizards. Birds came back to hunt the snakes. Small mammals moved in to eat the seeds from the new plants. Within 18 months, areas with high tortoise populations had wildlife diversity levels approaching pre-fire conditions. The tortoises had basically kicked off a cascade of recovery that was rolling out across the landscape like dominoes falling in reverse. But here's where the story gets even weirder. The tortoises were doing better than anyone expected. Survival rates in year two were actually higher than tortoises living in undisturbed habitat. Wait, what? How does that make sense? Shouldn't the perfect untouched desert be better than the apocalyptic hellscape? Turns out, no. And the reason why completely changes how we think about desert conservation. Established desert habitats are crowded. They're full. Every good burrow is taken. Every reliable food source has an owner willing to fight for it. Dominant males control the best territories. Younger or weaker tortoises get pushed to marginal areas where survival is harder. It's competitive. And competition takes energy. The burned desert? Empty. No competition. No territorial disputes. Just endless space and thanks to the tortoises themselves. Rapidly improving conditions. The released tortoises could dig burrows wherever they wanted. They could eat any plant they helped grow. They weren't spending energy fighting. They were spending it on survival and reproduction. And boy, were they reproducing. Scientists found nests everywhere. Female tortoises were laying more eggs than they did in captivity, and more than their counterparts in undisturbed habitat. The working theory is that reduced stress from competition combined with improving nutrition created ideal breeding conditions. But it's still early. Those eggs take years to hatch, and the babies take decades to mature we won't know the full impact of this boom for another generation. Meanwhile, something unexpected was happening with the plant community. They were old native, species that disappeared from Nevada deserts in the 1800s when cattle ranching exploded were showing up in genetic testing. How? The seed bank. Dessert soils contain seeds that can remain viable for over a hundred years. They're just waiting for the right conditions to germinate. The tortoises broke up the soil and provided water collection points. And suddenly, seeds that had been dormant since the Grant administration were waking up and getting to work. The desert wasn't just recovering. It was restoring itself to a version that existed before modern humans mucked it up. 
This caught the attention of fire ecologists studying the increasing problem of megafires in the American West. Climate change is making these fires bigger, hotter, and more frequent. Traditional recovery is slow, really slow. Some desert areas burned in the 1990s still look like parking lots. But the tortoise zones? They looked like they'd burned maybe a year ago, not three. Other states started paying attention. California has its own desert tortoise problems. So does Arizona and Utah. Everyone's dealing with the same issue. Declining tortoise populations, increasing fire frequency, and not enough money or time to manage it all with traditional methods. Nevada accidentally stumbled onto something that might actually scale. You don't need years of restoration work and millions in funding. You need tortoises and patience, mostly patience. Tortoises are not fast, but it wasn't all sunshine and newly grown desert marigolds. There were problems. Predators figured out pretty quickly that 100,000 slow-moving, shell-covered snacks had just been delivered. Raven populations exploded. Ravens love baby tortoises. They flip them over, crack them open like walnuts, and have a feast. Adult tortoises are usually safe inside their shells. But juveniles? Easy pickings. Then there were the roads. Tortoises don't understand asphalt. They see it as just another part of the landscape. Highway mortality spiked in areas near the release zones. Signs warning drivers about tortoise crossings went up. But let's be real. People driving 75 miles per hour through the Nevada desert aren't always watching for wildlife that moves at 0.3 miles per hour max. And there was controversy. Some conservation groups argued that this was still too risky, that Nevada was gambling with a threatened species for a quick fix to their warehouse problem. They weren't entirely wrong. If this had failed, if disease had swept through the concentrated populations or a second fire had hit before recovery took hold, it would have been catastrophic. We would have lost a huge percentage of Nevada's remaining tortoise population in one go. But it didn't fail. It worked. And now scientists are trying to figure out exactly why so they can replicate it. The leading theory combines several factors. First, the timing was perfect. Release right before monsoon season meant water was available for both tortoises and seeds. Second, the tortoises came from varied genetic backgrounds, making the population more resilient to stress and disease. Third, and this might be the most important, the burn was so severe that it actually reset the ecosystem to zero. No invasive plants, no established dominance, just blank slate conditions where the tortoise ecosystem engineering could work at maximum efficiency. It's a template now. Other agencies are designing similar programs, but they're learning from Nevada's accidental experiment. They're being more strategic about release locations, timing, and population density. They're installing predator controls around high-value areas. They're working with transportation departments to create safe crossing zones. This wasn't just a lucky accident. It was an accident that taught us something huge about how desert recovery works. The Carpenter One burn zone today looks nothing like it did in 2020. Aerial photos show a landscape that's not just green, but diverse. Different shades marking different plant communities. Clusters of shrubs growing up through the grasses. Trees starting to establish along ancient drainage channels that the fire had exposed. And everywhere, if you look close enough, tortoise burrows. Those burrows are still active. They'll remain active for decades. A single tortoise can live 80 years in the wild. The burrows they dig can last even longer, used by generation after generation of wildlife. The network of tunnels and chambers spreading across those 300,000 acres isn't just habitat for tortoises. It's infrastructure for an entire ecosystem, built by animals that move so slowly you can literally watch grass grow faster. There's something poetic about that. The slowest animals in the desert being the fastest route to recovery. In a world where we're used to instant solutions and quick fixes, where we throw technology at every problem, the answer turned out to be remarkably low-tech. Just put the right animals in the right place at the right time, and let nature do what nature does which is complicated, messy, unpredictable, and ultimately more clever than any human restoration plan. The project isn't over. Scientists are still monitoring the populations, tracking individual tortoises with GPS, analyzing plant communities and measuring about a thousand different variables to understand exactly what's happening and why. The data keeps coming in, and every year it tells the same story. 
this is working better than anyone expected. The tortoises aren't just surviving, they're thriving. And in the process, they're rebuilding an entire desert ecosystem from the ground up, or technically from the ground down. Since they start by digging, Nevada's accidental experiment proved something that ecologists have long suspected but rarely got to see in action. Nature isn't fragile, it's resilient, incredibly, almost frighteningly resilient, but it needs the right pieces in play. Take out a keystone species like the desert tortoise, and ecosystems collapse slowly over decades. Put them back even in the worst conditions imaginable, and recovery happens faster than anyone thought possible. Those 100,000 tortoises didn't just survive the burned desert. They conquered it, rebuilt it, and turned a disaster zone into a conservation success story that's rewriting the textbook on desert ecology. Not bad for an animal that's basically a rock with legs.